Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Cyber warfare refers to politically motivated computer hacking to conduct sabotage and espionage. It is information warfare. Security expert Richard A. Clark defines cyber warfare as actions by a nation state to penetrate another nation's computer or networks for the purpose of causing damage or disruption. America's electric grids, telecommunication systems, and the internet are still vulnerable to this form of attack. Our guest today, Dennis Bouvier, will attempt to explain the situation in layman's language. Professor Bouvier learned about computers and how to program them at the age of 16 using a book borrowed from a friend and a computer at his grandmother's house. Now he is an associate professor of computer sciences and serves as the acting chair of the computer science at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Dr. Bouvier, welcome to conversation. Did I get that pretty much right about cyber warfare? Yes, I think you have it pretty much right. Um, Last time that you were here, which was, weirdly enough, just about a year ago, um, we talked about viruses and virus protection. Compu this cyber warfare, that's sort of, I don't know, an extension of this or a precursor to, uh, to what we talked about last time? It's certainly an extension of what we were talking about. I, it's perhaps the only difference between what we were talking about last time and what we'll talk about today is who's behind what's going on. The, the basic um, mechanism by which people can manipulate your computer and, and therefore your information is the same. Well, in, uh, in our last discussion, it was really, it's hackers and those who put viruses out to damage our computers. It started out as a bunch of kids having a, a jolly time. Well, let's see what we can do, right? Right. Right. Although those kind of hackers, they, they become more sophisticated and it's not so jolly now. It's almost like a business. I wouldn't say almost like, I would say it's very much a business, a multi-billion dollar business worldwide. These guys wouldn't happen to work for the antivirus companies. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of people who think that the antivirus companies are behind a lot of what goes <clears throat> on, but I don't know that there's any evidence to support that. You'll, you'll always have conspiracy theorists about these sorts of things. So. As to the topic today of cyber warfare, <clears throat> the, uh, we're actually talking about a systemized attack by governments on other countries, right? That's correct. So now, of course, the number one country in the world that knows how to do that happens to be USA. There are those that uh, think that's the case. Uh, and I don't know that there's any way to know who has the most sophisticated operation because until you actually do something, you, you don't, we wouldn't know what the capabilities are. So one could suppose that we have the best uh, attack and defense mechanisms, but there are people who think that China actually have the best attack mechanisms and we have the best defense mechanisms but there would be no way to know unless there really were an all-out cyber war. You're a professor at Southern Illinois University in the engineering school, right? That is correct. And over the years that you've been there, and even before you were there, there was quite a number of Chinese students, haven't there? We haven't had a great number of Chinese students. The population of um, students from a different um, foreign national organization varies from year to year. So um, uh, there have been decades where there have been a large number of Chinese students and it's waned and, and waxed and waned over the years. Right. But I know because I was there years ago, there was a, a very large contingent of, uh, of Chinese students. Yes. Especially in the days before the Chinese really had uh, sophisticated universities in their own country. So they would send people over here to learn uh, engineering and the techniques that were necessary in order to 
properly programmed computers, et cetera. Absolutely. I suspect that perhaps some of them who were either at SIU or MIT or other places may have learned some of these techniques that we, the United States, have kind of taught these folks how to do what they're doing. That's certainly possible. So then they went home and their home government said, you know, we need what? What is it that the home government might have said that they were looking to do? Well, the, I suppose the premise of cyber war is twofold. One, if we can infiltrate the computer networks and find the information, um, usually information about the Department of Defense and what their weapon systems might be and what their uh, defense strategies might be, that that's certainly valuable if there were a conventional war. But then the other aspect of cyber war is being able to do damage remotely. And so um, there would be two goals, and you mentioned that in the introduction, that uh, gaining access to information and then manipulating um, utility grid and that sort of thing. So shutting down the electric power grid or causing other um, infrastructure damage. I think people don't uh, fully understand just how serious a matter, like electricity. I mean, during a storm, power goes off. You know, it's off for a couple hours, people are inconvenienced, they're really hot under the collar, especially on a day when it's maybe 105 outside. Um, or it's freezing cold outside mm -hmm. and the electricity goes mm -hmm. off and the furnace isn't working. Right. We're talking about a government wanting to do something, either military or political, and confusing the American nation at the same moment, right? That's, that's the objective here. The, the, I suppose the objective would be to disrupt daily life and whatever political fallout might happen from that. Uh, it would be hard to know exactly what a foreign national could do to the electric power grid unless it was done. Uh, there was, there have been a couple of really, really large power failures in Brazil, one in 2005 and one in 2007, and some people supposed that China had caused those power outages. Well, they're unknown whether or not China actually caused them. In fact, there are theories to the contrary. But th the, the reason why I bring this up is that it's certainly possible that China could have uh, disrupted the power grid in Brazil, or perhaps could disrupt the power grid in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about power outages over large areas for multiple days or weeks. And you, you mentioned the inconvenience and the, the discomfort of being in 105 degree weather with no air conditioning, but also think about uh, hospitals and um, police department and fire department, and if, and if everybody is without power, then there's far-reaching, potential far-reaching effects. And of course, if electricity goes off, then all of a sudden your cell phone goes off. And if it isn't off, as soon as it needs to be recharged, there's nowhere to charge it. That's correct. And even a lot of home phones, uh, non-AT&T phones, uh, are, they have to have uh, electricity and if there's no battery backup, then, then they go down shortly, like within about four hours. That's correct. So we live in a very, very fragile, uh, very fragile society. What else? I mean, I know you lecture on this, so why don't you just tell us a little bit more about the things that, uh, that you lecture your students about? Well, the potential uh, for breaking into the computer networks is a result of uh, the system not really being built for security. And so we created the internet without thinking about uh, security as a necessary component. Mm -hmm. And people started attaching devices to the, to the network because it was free and available and made for cost savings. So the electric power companies can monitor remote stations using internet connection. And the, the thing that allows us to monitor and control the power grid remotely is also the same mechanism that allows other people to uh, monitor and control the electric power grid because of the lack of uh, adequate security measures. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's possible that people with sophisticated enough techniques could start turning on and off different parts of the grid 
and as a result actually damage it. So the rapid turning of things on and off uh, is uh, simple enough but also quite potentially damaging to uh, components in the system. Uh, there, there are really interesting videos you can find on YouTube and one in particular that comes to mind is a video of a, uh, uh, I think it's a power generator that has, it's in a room by itself, there's nobody in there and it's connected to the network and someone uh, over the network is turning it on and turning it off and you can actually watch the machine jumping around and starting to blow smoke and it eventually catches on fire and, and ceases to function. Mm -hmm. And uh, the really interesting aspect of putting that on the network is the person that was controlling that device could have been anywhere in the world. It could have been in China. With a little, remote, with a little laptop computer. With a little laptop computer or, or even less. It, you know, it could have been a little tablet computer. Just the, the thing that they need is the appropriate knowledge of how the device works and therefore that gives you the knowledge of how you could possibly break it. Now explain to people, <coughs> because there's been this discussion about some hackers are able to send signals out to, I mean, hundreds if not thousands of computers. And then they're able to get these computers to kind of work in the background to do certain things. And I don't have a full understanding of this, but I'll bet you do. So try to explain to people what I'm trying to say to you. Well, what you're describing is uh, referred to as a botnet. A what? Botnet. Bot net. So it's uh, bot is short for robot and net being short for network. So a robot network. So uh, a robot, a botnet would be, as you described, a collection of hundreds or thousands or potentially tens of thousands of computers that have been compromised. Just regular people at home that don't even know that this is going on. Absolutely. In fact, that's quite frequently where these, what makes these botnets possible mm -hmm. is that people have computers at home that are on the internet. Now, if you had a computer at home and it wasn't connected to any network, it's not part of any botnet. But you, if you put it on the network and if it's not appropriately uh, controlled, then the same hacker who might be breaking in to see if your credit card information is on your computer might also break in and install software on your computer, which would be running, uh, though you wouldn't see it. There would be no window, there'd be no uh, display whatsoever from this botnet software on your computer. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's running and it's listening to the wet network. It's waiting for a command. And uh, one of the appropriate, well, appropriate might be the wrong word, but one of the uses of a botnet is to get all the computers to attack one site at roughly the same time. And so if uh, you wanted to punish a, uh, an online store, one way to do that is to get all of your bots in this network to go to the website all at the same time and overwhelm the servers and so legitimate customers wouldn't be able to get in uh, to the store and therefore the company would potentially suffer economic damage. And the same thing is true that a government may set this up and then at the appropriate moment use that to go and I, what do they call it? There's some sort of forced entry. I forget what the, the computer term is there, but it's kind of a hard, uh, a hard attack as opposed to a soft attack. You know what I'm ta referring to? I'm not sure. There's various terms that I've read, but I'm just not that technically adept to be able to articulate that. But my understanding is that, this, that these botnets are capable of being directed not just at a store, but those could be the ones directed at a nuclear power facility. Oh, absolutely. Or something that controls um, the electric grid. I don't think, uh, again, a lot of people may not understand the term electric grid just so that they understand. Uh, are you familiar with, uh, with how the system is set up across the United States? To some extent. Um, the electric grid is a very complex. Uh, it's not just one. I mean, the whole right. United States is not hooked up it's in various sections of, right. of the country. That's right. 
And so, you know, if you attack one, the rest of the country still goes on, but that area is, is, is brought down. Right. But we um, get a demonstration from time to time from Mother Nature of how large of a section is connected. So in the storms in the Northeast um, earlier this year that took out all of Connecticut and parts of New York and so forth and so on, uh, a lot of the what went down was because it's it's a grid and if you damage part of it then the grid itself is damaged and many people were without power because other people were without power and they had to repair it all and turn it all back on mm -hmm. so what is it that um, what is it that experts are saying that we as a nation need to do to defend ourselves against these hostile powers who could possibly use their knowledge to uh, go after our infrastructure? I haven't heard anything from the government that, that would be sort of a direct answer to what you're saying. And they're not telling the common man, this is what you need to do. Um, perhaps they should be. Um, because it is the common man and the common computer that is part of the problem, uh, that part of the, the reason that cyber warfare is possible. Um, but the government is actively doing a number of things, and one of the things that they're doing is developing talent. Uh, they have scholarship programs where they're getting uh, people involved in cybersecurity, so they're offering a scholarship if you study cybersecurity for a number of years, they'll pay for that education in return for service later. Um, they are also uh, developing tools and techniques with the, their existing talent. They're certainly putting a lot of money into um, creating a small army, though it's not an army like we normally think about. There won't be men in uniform with rifles on their on their backs or in their hands. It will be People with long lines of guys with computers. Long there. lines of guys with computers who are uh, not just trying to hack into things, but studying a lot of math and computer science to understand what techniques exist and how they work and how they don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a story that came out earlier this week about how an encryption technology that has been in use for uh, well, since about 1999, and still is in use, has been largely discredited as not being very secure, and it's still heavily in use. And so, uh, it was. So you're talking about like a door key that people have locked their house, and then it turns out that everybody has a key, or at least potentially bad people have the key. Well, I would, I would perhaps change your analogy slightly. It's, a, it's like a door lock that locks, except that it's not that hard to pick. And people with the right tools can get in in, in not too much time. It, mm -hmm. it is locked, mm -hmm. and it will keep out some people, mm -hmm. but it won't keep out people who have the appropriate resources. Now, it turns out the appropriate resources are not hard to get, and that's really the problem. So even if I don't understand how to pick that lock, I can call somebody up, uh, a, a locksmith, sort of speak, and say, hey, I want to pick this lock, and I can have it happen for about $200. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the word math a little while ago. How important is math to uh, computer science and uh, learning how to do the things you're talking about? Math is the foundation of computer science, uh, but not math like most people think about it. When I say math, a lot of people think... You're not think talking about one plus one is two. I'm not talking... Well, arithmetic is there, but I mean, everybody understands arithmetic. But I'm not talking generally about uh, algebra or trigonometry, things that uh, people remember from high school. I'm really talking more about logic um, and counting principles and other foundations that are used in creating algorithms uh, or which people commonly think of as programs. Mm -hmm. And so it really is, logic, which is a, a subsection of math, really is the foundation for everything that we do in both building computers and in programming them. And so uh, every computer scientist understands uh, the basic mathematics and 
And so the, the, I guess the answer to your question is that um, it's essential. The understanding of mathematics is essential. Now, fortunately, uh, the mathematics that we need to know to do this sort of stuff isn't that hard. Um, but the people who are developing the encryption technologies get into a little bit heavier, a little bit deeper math. And that really is a, a specialization. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you would, anybody who's listening to this that has children in school, you would encourage them to spend more time on math? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, professor, I would <laughs> expect you to do that. Because math just doesn't, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I just get the feeling that a lot of uh, young people are coming out of high school without a good math foundation. Do you find that? I mean, as a professor, and y you teach entry-level classes, too. I do. So what, uh, what, what do you find? Well, again, the, the math that's required to do the programming isn't the upper-level math. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that we've been quite fortunate at uh, Edwardsville to attract some of the best and brightest students from southern Illinois and, and the surrounding area. And uh, so we really don't have a problem with the math skills of the students mm. that we attract. Um, but I would imagine if perhaps some other uh, person were here, they might comment differently on the math skills of high school students. Well, even at my age, I'm still taking classes, but at community college level, and I've discovered that uh, kids are coming in, they need remedial English, <laughs> they need remedial math, and they're coming right out of high school. So mm -hmm. that's something I don't understand. Let's talk about something else that's been in the news lately, but perhaps has gone over people's head, and this is a computer virus that was used to attack the Iranian <coughs> nuclear program. Okay. Um, it's in the news even now. Uh, mm -hmm. part, uh, it's become even part of the uh, presidential campaign in the United States. But mm -hmm. just from the beginning, what was it? What was it called? What did it do? Okay, so you're referring to the Stuxnet virus and um, quite a bit about the Stuxnet virus is still not known because it's essentially, uh, well, I would be overstating it to say it's an act of cyber war or cyber terrorism because um, the definition would be nation against nation and uh, I don't know that we know for sure who created it and so uh, perhaps it is and perhaps it is not cyber war. There's uh, speculation in the press that it was the Israeli government and the United States government. Absolutely. Just, it's speculation. Go speculation. Ahead. So the, um, the cyber community, the cybersecurity community has gotten a hold of a copy of the virus. It's, it's much like a doctor grabbing a blood sample and analyzing it to see what's there. And they've looked at this virus and and understood how at least parts of it work. And what it, did it do to this uh, to this Iranian nuclear program? So um, I'm not a nuclear scientist, All so right. I don't understand everything that goes on on the other end of it. But uh, part of creating uh, weapons grade or even high grade uranium involves putting material and spinning it very rapidly so that the very dense material is separated from the lighter material and the device that spins it's called a centrifuge and uh, uranium is a very heavy material so if you're spinning it the uranium separates from other material and you concentrate it and therefore you have a more powerful material and so, uh, as I described earlier about the generator that's turned on and turned off and turned on and off, it shakes and eventually destroys itself. Well, a centrifuge spinning very rapidly is, is similar to this, that if you spin it at different speeds at different times, that it will shake um, and uh, potentially destroy itself. And that's exactly what the Stuxnet virus was able to do except in a very sophisticated way. So the virus got into the controller, which is essentially a specialized computer that was controlling the centrifuge. The controller is supposed to make sure the centrifuge runs at the right speed. But what the virus did was make the centrifuge run at different speeds at different times so that it would shake and physically come apart 
while at the same time it made it look like to the rest of the computer network that things were operating normally. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a virus <coughs> that is essentially a, a program that has infected this computer, uh, controlling the centrifuge, but reporting something different to the people who are... And these are smart guys, and they didn't realize what was going on. That's Absolutely. how sophisticated this thing was. Absolutely. Which is, again, the danger here in the United States, that something like that can be applied here or anywhere else in the world. And even more uh, astounding than that, the, the device that the Stuxnet virus attacked is the same device that are used in other places. But the virus was able to figure out that, hey, I'm in Iran, and those are the centrifuges that I want to attack. So the same virus was on thousands of computers across the world, but didn't do any damage to other devices. It was a very sophisticated uh, virus in that it can do the right damage in the right place, and yet appear as though it was not there. We got about like two minutes left to the end here. Is there anything that you would like to say before we finish up on the subject of cyber warfare? Gosh, this is such a big topic. There's I know, <laughs> I, I, and we talked about this beforehand that right. 30 minutes doesn't do it justice, but right. what, what, what would you, as a coda, what would you, what would you say at the end? Well, I think that um, it's going to be interesting to see what the government decides to do. Uh, with respect to cyber war. Uh, you've seen stuff in the press recently that the government hasn't figured out what exactly it wants to define as cyber war. It hasn't figured out what policies it wants to put into place. And um, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what uh, the current administration and future administrations decide to do, um, both in defining policy and creating strategies to, to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for those young people out there that might be interested in a career, there's plenty of openings and demand for people who understand computer security, um, in particular cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. Does SIU place people into things like this? We do not uh, specialize in computer security and, and we don't have a, a lot going on in, in uh, cyber warfare. Um, but there are some very good universities in the United States for mm -hmm. this. And just last 30 seconds, what, uh, what would someone who comes to SIU School of Engineering learn about in the area of computers and computer programming? I'm not sure that I can address that in 30 yeah. seconds, but we offer uh, a very comprehensive computer science degree program and, and place students into career positions all across the metro area and uh, from coast to coast. I've had your dean, not just, not just the current dean, but the previous dean say, he put SIU E's engineering school up against Wash U any day. Do you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. I appreciate your coming on such short notice, too. You're very welcome. And to my audience, I've been speaking with uh, uh, Dr. Dennis Bouvier. He's a professor of, uh, at the School of Engineering at SIU Edwardsville in their uh, uh, computer programming department. Hopefully you learned a little something from this. We'll see the rest of you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.